Hello everyone, Russell Wright and Sue Bell here from NetworkEmpire.com and ThemeZoom.com. Really excited to jump into this very popular, starting to get quite a lot of questions and positive feedback from everybody about the uh, bring your own website review. And it's been, I think probably the, the uh, excitement around it has been that everybody's site's a little bit different and 95% of the students that we deal with really are struggling to fully comprehend the, the linking structure of website silo architecture and then how it connects to the rest of our products and services. So Sue, thank you so much for joining us today to um, go through some of these sites with people. Oh, my pleasure, Russell. It's a total delight to be here. Thank you. And uh, let me see, we have people starting to kick into the, uh, into the call and I just would uh, you might want to hand me uh, the question um, oh. question uh, panel, Sue. Absolutely. Before we get too deep into this, I forgot to switch that on. And if anybody has any questions, obviously feel free. And we do try to uh, keep the webinar under an hour and 15 minutes, hour and half. What we're really looking for. Sue, did you already have uh, bring your own? Did you already have people bring their own? Oh, actually, we do. Hands? We got them right here. We got oh, some people yeah. that have some courage. It's like Deb is uh, willing to bring forward a domain. Excellent. If anybody, oh, here's another one. Yeah. All um, right. Oh my goodness, they're coming in. Okay, so. <laughs> all right. So I want to talk about one first before we get started. Okay. Because, all right. Um, I'll just step out of the way, and again, everybody knows how to use this uh, question area. Yeah. And, just uh, shoot us your questions and comments and and websites. Excellent. Thank you. So, um, um, Rand Fiskin did a Whiteboard Friday last Friday. He talked about, um, it got republished in SEO by the Sea, a couple of comments back and forth, and somebody shot it to me for comment. And I just wanted to talk about one of the sites in particular. Um, he was talking about how he was perceiving that anchor text link may be weakening because he was looking at the inbound anchor text and the on-page factors at, uh, for f cell phone ratings. He took four different examples, but I'm just going to shoot you. We're just going to talk about one today, and then I'll get on to your guys' personal websites. So he was looking at cell phone ratings, and he's looking at consumer reports, and he's saying, you know, they don't really target this keyword, and it it looked like a mystery as to why they were ranking. And so he talked about possible reasons why they were ranking so well for that term, because it is kind of a competitive term. And so I went to the site. I just had to dig. <laughs> and I went to, to take a look at what was going on on page here. And while this page, in and of itself, you look at the URL string, you look at the, the H1 tags and, and those kinds of things, normal on-page factors, and you go, yeah, okay, it's not, um, it's not completely optimized for um, cell phone ratings, but when you look at this, like, especially if you look at the HTML, that's always where I start, right, because that's how the search engine sees your site, is via um, HTML. They don't get to see all your pretty graphics and everything. Um, so if we look for cell phone ratings, well, let's just look for um, actually, let's look for ratings, because clearly the page is about cell phones, right? But the idea here is, is that it's more about service than it is about ratings. So let's just look for the term ratings and see what we've got. And um, first of all, you, you do have the keyword in the metadata, although it's not, um, it's possibly not all concatenated, but all of the keywords are there. And then... Um, I also found it really interesting that you get a feel that the site is actually a lot about ratings, a lot about different kinds of ratings. And then you come down here to where you've got cell phone ratings, like in this list, right? And that's actually, go away, be nice, that's actually this little list right here. And so as you look I think it's that one anyway. Actually, that's a sub-tabs. Um, overview. Not the right list, actually. Let's come on down a little bit further. Uh, 
I think this is the one I'm looking for. So when you actually find this box right here, you'll see that the box itself has got all over it in div tab names and in um, just in all of the meta type data that it's talking very much about ratings. And then as you get in here, you'll see that the the links that it's going to are all about ratings, right? Ratings overview, um, ratings overview. So these are different kinds of ratings overviews that they're talking about here. And then down the middle of the page, it's got cell phone ratings, right? This is nothing but a series of rated pages where they're doing cell phone ratings on all of these different kinds of cell phones. And so the thing that I found really interesting is that even so this page isn't actually geared towards cell phone ratings, it's essentially the landing page for a bunch of rating pages. In other words, it's linking to all of these other cell phone rating pages on the site. And because it's the hub for all of those pages, it's the page that gets listed in the SERPs. So I just, like to me, that just totally spoke to the power of silo structure. It's not really a silo structure because if you if you link down here, well, I, I should say it's a virtual silo structure, right? Because if you if you follow the URL, um, no, actually it's not too bad, but it's it's not exactly the same URL with just this page extended like that URL extended underneath it. It's quite a bit longer, so it's actually another page on the site. It's also under curl, but in a different section within the site. So it's not as tightly structured a silo as it could be, and it's totally virtual in that regard, but the point of it being the links to the other pages with these anchor texts told Google that that's what this page is all about, that this is the hub page for those topics. So I just kind of wanted to throw that out and uh, show you the power of thematic linking, um, and if you do it with a little bit more intention as you're building out your silo structure, the kind of oomph it can give you with your site's rankings. So without further ado, um, let me just see if anybody asked a question about that particular thing. All right, so, um, so then without further ado, let's take a, a look at the first um, the first site that guys have shot me here. The first one should be livestock. Yeah, I'm going to have to type it in. I can't figure out how to grab it from that. Livestock, forages. Forage solution dot com. All right, Let's see if I type that right. Okay, nice simple landing page, just a video squeeze page kind of a thing with some options to your other pages. And if I go under hydroponic fodder results, so there's no, no off-site linking there, there's no um, subordinate pages, it's just that one page. Ah, and then this one's got some subordinate pages, but you've got it in a drop down. Is that also a drop down from the home page? Yeah, it is. Okay, so my first comment is chances are really high you're going to bleed your page rank by having this style of a menu where you can see your subordinate pages there. What you're essentially doing is linking to all of your pages from all of your pages and that does a really nice job of flattening your page rank across your website. So um, the, the whole idea behind a silo structure is that the home page links only to the silo pages and then the silo pages link to the subordinate pages within that silo and those subordinate pages link back up to the silo landing page and so that gives the silo landing page um, more page rank oomph that way. It's, um, it's a really cool thing that I talk about in one of the blog posts on Network Empire. And, um, and so then, because the idea behind it is that your silo landing pages are the keywords that are most profitable to your site. 
And so you want the most page rank there so that you've got the best chance of ranking for them. With that aside, um, I would also say, I don't know how difficult it seems like these, let me just take a quick look here for a sec. Um, Fodder tech hybrid. Hydroponic forage, hydroponic fodder. My guess is that hydroponic fodder is not a terribly difficult term to rank for, but I just want to see. So if I take a look at the very first result, surprisingly enough, um, a page rank three, and They've got all the keywords in the URL string. They don't have too much content, but they have a lot of pictures. And if their pictures, yep, they haven't done a bad job naming their pictures. Eh, ishness. It could be better, but it's not bad. Um, and it's a page rank three. How have you done with your pictures? Fodder solutions. Forage solutions. Kind of an interesting topic as I look at it. Um, Is this a YouTube video that's blocked? I mean, I don't see any signs of it. That's why I ask. And... Yay, block YouTube videos. <laughs> so um, my initial comment is going to be you would benefit from a little bit more text. You'd benefit from some more multimedia. Um, also proceed with caution on transparent containers for text. It's really not related to anything Sue's uh, lecturing on today, but just wanted to point that out. That it's proven to be difficult. You can't in transparent container. The container is the shingle on which the text is written, and that can be really, really good as long as it's not got text on it. We use it all the time for images, but not so much for text you'll see a lower conversion because people can't read it. I know it seems like it looks pretty. This is some... Um... You've got some crazy long names in your classes. I don't know if that was like a proprietary something or another, or an off-the-shelf something or another, but those are some crazy long names. Um, style sheets, which are good. Meta properties, good. I mean, I just, as I look at it, I see a heck of a lot of metadata to data ratio, and of course it's also really long. It might just be, no, that's all pretty much metadata. Yeah, I got the one block quote there. Um... Oh, is this what you're talking about, the, the transparency? 
Yeah, the transparent container, right? Yeah. With, with the text on it. Yeah. It's very po very popular, and I've tested different things. Um, it's not a problem, but what's really nice for is like you know, like Launch Effect uses it, and these other things. Just be careful not to have any seriously uh, intellectual things, and try to get the transparency just at the bare minimum if you're going to use it. Yeah, if you have something really important that you want them to read, you want to do it like that, where you've got a a completely um, opaque background to it. Right. I have, uh, I have a much higher success with opt-ins using kind of transparent design and stuff like that, but uh, not not for main text. Right. Yeah, I mean, overall, it's a nice site. I think it's um, a bit light on the text, and I think it's going to be a bit light on the engagement, and I also don't see, like on your other pages, um, your home page has got a really clear quality call to action, request for quote, but on your other pages. She might, hmm? she might be all right if she goes a shade um, less transparent or two degrees. Might be able to pull it off. Yeah. I see what she's trying to do with the design. But yeah. Everybody has an opinion. <laughs> yeah. It's really more opinion than it is. Yeah, I did it on my blog for a while. I liked it. Um, I would um, I would do something with the style sheet on this. I find this you're not going to get as many people to um, you, how can I say that? You could make that look a lot nicer and people would be more inclined to fill it out, I think. Um, and I I'm uh, I haven't actually read the text. Call now to get your high. Okay, so you, there's your call to action, but give me a telephone number right there. I mean, I know it's right there, but make it a little larger. Like, just stick it right there in that same bold font. Yeah. Or if you want to leave it in the footer, then at least make it a little bit larger font. The other thing you could do, depending on how, I mean, I would just like try to get them on the phone. That usually is a quicker close anyway, but the other thing you could do would be to hyperlink contact us to your contact form. If you're, if you would prefer to have all of that information going into a call, do you have space for a phone number here? Oh, yeah, right there at the top. Yeah, cool. So those are my comments. Um, how long has the site been up? Three weeks. Okay. Check the blog. All right. Is this it? There's an, is there more to the blog than this? Okay. Then I have to say that that's not intuitive, that there's more to the blog. Is it? Okay. Because if, if I click then, here, I'm not in the blog anymore. Yeah, no, I understand, Deb. But what we're trying to figure out is you wanted us to look at the blog from the beginning for siloing and ignore the, the, the website, the absolute domain. So what what do you want us to analyze for silo structure? Because obviously this was made with our plugin, right? Okay, so we are doing the whole thing. Okay. So um, you used the plugin on the blog, and obviously you did not use the plugin on the first site. Okay. Okay. So I guess what Sue is saying is not intuitive. It's the transition from the main site to the blog. But it, again, I have some questions for you. What do you sell? Um, that are more conversion based. But first, let's just do the silo architecture. Well, yeah, it's fine to have a um, just answer. Everybody listening, Deb is asking, is it okay to have a blog off of the primary domain? Absolutely. And absolutely it is. The question is, what is the purpose of the blog, and what is the purpose of the main domain? 
and the blog is great for pinging and I'm creating a constant update of information quickly. Plus, you have all the advantages of automated plugins that you may or may not use, and or the blog silo blog builder plugin that comes directly from DWS that we created. Um, you also need on, on the main page to make really clear to your readers what the blog is for, because you did notice that Sue said that it's not intuitive. That means that it wasn't clear why she would want to go there. And sometimes that can be just a call to action. If you look on other sites, other sites it'll tell you what their blog is for. Like keep updated. Like for example, if you're going to do industry news curation on the blog, that's a really great place to do it rather than your main domain. Uh, keeping people up to date, maybe putting a widget from the blog on the main site from the blog, just a little sneak peek if you even know follow it or whatever, just to give people an understanding that you have a constant news feed running from your blog that's updating more frequently than the main site. Um, that's one thing that could be done. But it really depends on what it is you're trying to do. Yeah, you could have um, an RSS feed over on the, the sidebar of your site or something along those lines. But it looks to me, like I'm, I'm assuming, like this isn't under slash blog anymore, so it doesn't seem to me like it's part of your blog, but I'm starting to get the feel that maybe the entire site's a blog. I didn't really look for that when I started. Um, and it looks like within the blog there's only one silo and I'm not sure if that's I'm just not sure if that's what you intended um, livestock forage solution looks like the the others are not updating alright so there's, there's um, a disconnect my gut hunch is, is that probably something got renamed like your categories got renamed or the pages got renamed and the categories don't match anymore something along those lines I think we need to go back into that silo area and the members area and put in some um, some more assist for guys that are making changes to stuff after it's already loaded in because um, if you change there's there's a relationship in the naming convention between the category and the page so if you change the name of the page, then it, it doesn't understand that it belongs to that category anymore. And so then when you add other stuff, it doesn't show up because the stuff that you're adding, it's thinking belongs to the category. So um, Deb, why don't you put in a help ticket on that, and we'll get you squared away. And I'll use yeah. that as a basis to update the members area. Correct. Yeah, Deb, we need to find out something. You, oh, shoot. All right. Well, I'm glad you said something. Um, <laughs> yeah, and Deb, listen, if you're not getting a response in that amount of time, then that's yeah, why I, you have my personal phone number. Yeah. You have my personal phone number and my personal email. That's not, it only takes about two days. If we haven't gotten back to you in 48 hours, then we then something malfunctioned with, yeah. your, with your help desk ticket. Yeah. And we haven't had that problem before uh, very often. So just pick up the phone, okay? Yeah. Um, because, yeah, that disconnect, there's a couple of things happening there, and, and we'll walk you through it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's. But thank um, you for the weird. Thank you for the weird topic. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me just take a look at this. Um, the next person in line. Let me just yeah. make sure that they're they're all members. Um, we're going to do member stuff first. So if you're not a current domain of studio member and you don't get called on, don't be mad. That's why you should buy a subscription. Bar dash um, reviews. Yeah. Pull up bars. And it's not that we won't do yours, it's just we're going to do members first, and then anybody who's guest will Oops. jump on you towards the end if we have time still. It's going to be bull dash up dash bar dash reviews. Yeah. There you go. Well, Sue's pulling that in. Oh, okay. It's okay. What were you going to say? Well, I was just going to answer Guy. It's kind of a on the fly thing. He doesn't give a domain, but it's kind of an interesting question. Okay. While you're assessing this. Sure. Um, he says his main branded sites. Yeah, I know you are, Vincent. Thanks. <laughs> I know you remember. Um, <laughs> the the one, um, guy is saying that the the one that has specific instructions and passwords and details just for clients and warm prospects would be hard to silo. On the other hand, he can understand having strict silos on uh, WR2 sites that all point to branded sites, still I can't see strictly selling the branded one. Um, 
I, Guy, you actually haven't give us, given us enough information to really make that decision. The answer is almost always it depends. And what it depends on is um, I need to know more about what those logins and passwords are. Are they product driven? Uh, is it a membership site? Because you absolutely can silo a membership site. Sadly, many of the softwares using membership site make it difficult for you to silo. And we can walk you through some suggestions and some tips and tricks to be able to do that nonetheless. The other issue is, we get that a lot. I mean, it's not a new guy. Like, we hear it all the time. Um, you know, we understand the concept of siloing and this and that, but it's really more trouble than it's worth. Or what is the diminishing return? You know, we have somebody on a Magento or on another large e-commerce platform, you know, whatever. And there is a cost assessment. And that's, if something is serious and you do have a technical serious problem, I strongly recommend hitting the help desk, maybe hitting Sue and myself up for a couple of hours of coaching. And I'm not doing that just to sell you something. I'm saying that when you're dealing with complexities, I can't tell you how many people who have complicated things that are happening uh, that when they do a quick, maybe an hour long consulting with Sue or something like that, they walk away with a clear direction, including the technical infrastructure. And part of the challenge is that unless you've built the site from the ground up using our stuff, our software and the rest, it's hard, you know, Sue has to actually back engineer the technical infrastructure and how it's set up. All yours, Sue. Okay. This is good. So I'm here in the pull-up bar of Silo. On the home page, you don't have a menu. You've just got links to, um, to the different product categories, which is fine. And then I'm here under pull-up bars, and you've got different kinds of pull-up slash push-up. Um, those being kind of sort of synonyms. And um, yep, pull up bar. Yeah, uh, these are great. Um, I mean, I haven't looked at the HTML yet, but buy from Amazon.com. So it's an Amazon site. Cool. Do you really need all this fitness equipment? That's a great question. Makes me really want to do pull-ups. No, just kidding. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a good amount of content. And um, and we're here in the pull-up bar, so yeah, it's a, a great silo structure. Um, what did you, uh, Jeffrey, what did, what did you build this in? Is this a WordPress theme? Okay. There we go. Artifacts. Yep, WordPress. Okay. Got that. Everybody's loving that image in the header. And tell us a little bit, think a little bit out loud, Sue, here. What is it that you're watching? I'm, right I'm looking at, um, at the content. I'm looking at the links. Um, I'm, I'm just looking for reinforcement, basically, of the theme of the page that we're on. Um, and then I'm coming back up here to the top to see if you've got some kind of an SEO plugin that's giving you metadata. And you got a title, best fitness equipment money can buy, and I don't see a description. No, no description. So you've got the meta title, but no meta description. So that's the only thing that I can see so far that I would change. Um, not a, a deal breaker, but it Vinny, just allows that, you to. Vinny's asking you about the over -hyphena, hyphenation of the domain? What's your view on that? Oh, you know, um, Google will take a hyphen and, and replace it with a space. So that's not a biggie. And if you're, um, especially if the words could be misconstrued into something that you don't want them to be, hyphens are okay. Um, I find that they're not as conducive for people to actually type in, but if you're looking to be 
linked to and found in the search engines and that kind of stuff, then that's fine. If I were going to have a domain that I were going to like announce over um, a TV commercial or an audio somehow, then I would probably wouldn't put hyphens in it. Yeah, I mean, I've the, the time when I use them is when I really when there's two words of the same kind, two letters of the same that are the same that separate two words. Right. And when I'm doing our our offline marketing handles, it is helpful sometimes. Otherwise, you get some weird things. Yeah. But yeah, I think uh, you got a page rank one already. How long has the site been live? Yeah, Jeffrey. Silos so designed using data from TLKT. Excellent. Okay, it's about all right. That's about right. About a year. Okay. You do. Uh, I won't announce this, Jeffrey, but you're using some kind of backlink program, or you're just doing regular you're link doing building. Doing it yourself, in the <laughs> Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> um, his answer was very little for those of you on the call. Okay. Just basic stuff. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I mean, I would, if you're going to advertise this kind of stuff at the top, um, what that basically is used for is um, social justification. In other words, other people like this, so you should like it too. And so if you've got zeros, I normally don't display them. And if I'm going to display them, I go out and make sure that I've got non-zeros in there to start with. Um, but yeah, I think with a bit of a backlinking campaign, you probably... How, how difficult are the terms to rank for? And Jeffrey? Okay. A fast way, a fast and brainless, mindless way to get rid of the zeros on your social, what I call the courtesy uh, buttons, is either, of course, to do it in-house yourself and just don't leave them zero, or you can remove them uh, in the style sheet. When some of the some of the style sheets in the blogs will have those right in there, um, and they'll allow you to remove the numbers. Um, a zero of any kind on social proof on the blogs. I've tested this. It absolutely does have a negative effect. So remove the zeros if you can, or else go buy some fake clicks. Yeah. Or um, I, I'm using something right now called Social Adder. Um, it's been confirmed by associates of mine. I uh, know Matt Trainer and, and other guys have, have really been using it. And I'm really happy with what it's doing. I mean, it can actually lift up a full page rank over about three or four months just by the Google Pluses coming from it. And we talk more about this in the Google Plus Plus course. Um, it's pretty inexpensive um, to automate using it, and then that way you won't. You'll always have a couple of likes on there and a couple of G pluses, and all you got to do is submit it quickly into the system, and then it'll start just dripping. You just click, set it to drip, and over the course of four or five months, it'll start dripping all these and tweeting these things over time. It's very inexpensive. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, you don't have a lot of competition for some of these terms. You could easily get ranked. I, my bet is, since the Alexa bar is um, grayed out, that you don't have a lot of traffic to the site. And uh, and I think you easily could without too much effort. Um, I'd be tempted to throw some traffic at it just to see how well it converts. And then once you know how well it converts, you can decide how much time and effort you want to spend building that traffic toward it. Um, the other thing that I would consider doing, like basically your only monetization is Amazon. And I would be inclined to at least stick an opt-in on here. I mean, I know an opt-in takes a little bit of time too because then you've got to you gotta have you gotta send them stuff. You gotta develop some emails that you can send them. But um, I think that actually your money would be in the list in this kind of a site because 
if you send them off to Amazon, I mean, if they click off to Amazon, the cool thing about it is no matter what they buy from Amazon within the, the next 30 days or until they click their cookies, you'll get a commission off of it, whether it's um, pull-up bars or not. But you could easily create a list and monetize that list in other ways besides Amazon that might bring you more money. Um, just a thought. I mean, if you really wanted to get into this, if you really wanted to do it, I'd. It, it's such a fanatic market. It's one of those really passionate markets. Um, you run a blog post and you just like curate the the news items through your blog post, and you could gen quite a bit of traffic that way. Run it through some social platforms. It, it just depends on how passionate yeah, I get you some, are. Uh... Sorry, go ahead, Russ. Oh, I was just going to say, get some videos on there. Yeah. Either block the return or get a channel that you have that you're either cloning the most popular things and driving traffic and page rank. Yeah. It's a perfect market for that. It is. It's an absolutely perfect market for that. Okay, Jeffrey's asking oh. a, good, a good question. He's kind of asking you to give a, a thumb up or thumb down. Can he use this site as a demo for Silo? Absolutely. I guess she's giving you mostly thumbs up. Yeah. I feel personally there's some conversion issues, but they're minor. And um, for a good basic outline as a demo site, I think you're pretty, you're, you're evolving really well, Jeffrey. You know, as far as the, the infrastructure. Yeah. Yeah, just from a technical silo yeah. perspective, it's great. Yeah, what you've done is um, is not for amateurs. So, congratulations, you win the uh, booby prize. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, what's our next site? Okay, let's go ahead and see. Um, I think I'm going to go with um, Vincent. He's been waiting patiently. But now I have to find his actual domain. I don't know if he had it. Oh, yeah, here it is. Um, www.99curtains.com. Numbers? 99, yeah, numbers. Curtains, C-U-R, yeah, that's it. Okay. And hopefully we'll get to you as well, Jonathan. Oh, okay. Good, 74 people. They look like real people, at least some of them. That's good. Wait a minute, I know that icon. Yeah, he got that. <laughs> I commend you for the like box. That, I found that that alone affects both conversion. I can't vouch for ranking or anything like that. But. All right, cool. Are the uh, people in the like box real, Vincent, or did you buy those? They look real. Okay. Okay. Hmm. Is this a W? This is a main. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. I see you used the um, etch of video software that came out for your video, <laughs> the automated way of. Um, fake whiteboarding, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Nice. It's a pretty interesting software for those of you watching. You know how the the arts, I think the British arts, something or other, uses the you know made really popular the the um, what do they call it? The video whiteboarding. You know where you draw on the whiteboard and draw out the entire thing. Yeah. Got, yeah. Well, it's it was expensive, but Greg, this video on here is actually an automated version of it. Keith Baxter used it, pointed it out to me. There's actually a software that now that gives you the illusion of drawing your stuff on the whiteboard. And they have all these templates created for you in advance. To me, it kind of looks a little bit hokey because I can tell it's not a real hand. Like, play that video there, Sue. Okay, that, that hand is just moving around. There's not somebody really drawing it. Okay, see that's all automated. 
This offers about 49 bucks a month. I'll try to get the name of it for you, but it's kind of an interesting thing just for you guys to just take note of in the marketing field. It's a heck of a lot cheaper than having somebody actually do it. Yeah, which is around three to three grand. <laughs> so $49 plus uh, you can outsource it. To me, it looks a little hokey, but uh, new, you know, the non-educated market doesn't know that. Doesn't really. You know. Right, they're not going to notice it. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Vinny. Vincent. We got we got Vin, we got Vinny and Vincent on the call, so I'm trying to confuse you. <laughs> so Vincent Vincent said he paid two hundred dollars for that video, and I got to tell you that is okay. probably the third third most converting type of video right now out there. I don't know what is going. Actually, I do know why it works, but we're good. We'll avoid that. Go ahead, Sue. That's good. You got a lot of good trust building things going on on this page. Um, there's there's something about above the fold that doesn't quite sit right with me, and I'm not exactly sure what it is. I don't know if it's because the rather contrastless menu sits above the call to action. And you shouldn't have the flyouts here, but I talked about that already on the last site, so I won't beat a dead horse. Um, there's a thing that I just came across. Um, let me see if I have that. Site Tuner's Heat Map. Here we go. AttractionWizard.com. So you can pay a penny to AttractionWizard.com and get 10 heat maps. And um, I've been doing that. I've got um, a client who wants, um, wants to come up with a template and then clone it to a bunch of blogs. And so we've been playing around with the heat map. And it's been really kind of interesting. In fact, I'll probably do a video and put it up in the members area. And um, it's been really helpful. It's not a lot of stuff that I didn't already know, but it just kind of draws attention to it. So, like, people's eyes are going to go to where there's a strong contrast. So you've got strong contrast down here in your opt-in, which is good. Um, you've got red up here in your headline. You've got some red in your logo. And... Overall, everything else is kind of um, kind of all falls into the background, which is not a bad thing. Quotations now call us. Um, you've got good images. You've got a reasonable layout. I would lose this on the home page. Um, but there's something. I don't know. So it's something in the colors right up there at the top that just it doesn't feel um, symmetrical or something. I, I would try. I would play around with with popping your opt-in up above the menu and see if that doesn't feel a little bit better. I also feel like the opt-in's just a smidge close. I don't know how you might be constrained with your widgets, but um, if you could shove that away so that there was a little bit of white space or a little bit of background showing through between them. But that's just all aesthetics. Like aesthetics is a whole other thing aside from um, the technical aspect of what your site looks like. Right. It looks like for those of you looking at his headline and stuff, it's kind of got an optimized press. That's something called WP Sales Press. It's just a plug-in he has in his blog. You can make those images like that. And um, I always convert higher when I use that font. I, no matter how ugly it looks, yeah, <laughs> it just doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we make our banners with a similar font based on the testing. I got Mr. Belcher, I guess, ended up testing those over a wide conversion ratio. Uh, Vincent is saying that his main challenge is to push the ranking further up mm. um, his targeted keyword. So let's just take a look at the. Yep. So the first point. thing I do, I would do, is lose the flyouts because that's bleeding your page rank. You got to pay. You've only got a page rank one here. Um, I would assume. 
that curtains and blinds are probably based off your home page, that those are the two things. Actually, that just bounces you around to the, oh, that's why it says home. Okay, I'm with you now. And then a curtains gallery. See, that's going to fall to page rank zero. Just bang out the box. And if we go to blinds, that's got a page rank zero. Yeah, you're not going to get any rankings for that because, first of all, you don't have enough inbound link juice to your site. And second of all, it just um, bleeds your page rank out over all your pages. Um, just a quick question, Vincent. Um, what, is, what SEO plugin or default plugin are you using for SEO on this? All-in-one SEO, okay. Well, um, Greg, no, generally speaking, the drop-down menus, and I should let you speak to this, Sue, but drop-down menus is pretty easy to be bleed theme rank or page rank and theme. Yeah, is absolutely. There, there, drop drop-down and fly-outs are the same thing. Like, what you want to avoid. Yeah, is there a way to do it without bleeding? This is a common question I get. Um, no. What you want to have on your home page are just these links here and not these links that fly out over here. Right. And, and then when you link into blinds, then you want these other, on that page is where you want these other dozen or so subcategories to show up. So if I'm here on blinds, um, rather than having the links to everything under all your other silos, there would be another. OK. Um, so I'm going to. Goran asks a question which I get a lot, and it's kind of one of those don't get me started questions, Goran, <laughs> um, because it, it, this is where Sue's world and my world meet. Okay, so we have plenty of testing that shows, like when a website owner, like a couple of our really large clients right now with super huge e-commerce sites, right, that are just yep. like, don't get us started, they're so huge. Actually, but, yeah, let's just look at, look at that because... Uh, okay, but let me, let me finish the point yeah. here because it speaks to everything you've been teaching me through the years and Absolutely. What, we constant, what we constantly have to do with our clients and then where, my, where the neuromarketing knowledge, you know, predictably irrational, yep. um, all the other things kind of overlaps. It's okay to have a menu or a massive database or kind of a DMOS or over, a shock and awe, you know, directory of products and stuff for people but we've shown that most most users are not Amazon.com, okay? They have their own section. See that? This is their own page for this kind of stuff, all right? And they're, they're kind of, they're an e-commerce site that's massive. My point here is that it may seem like a good idea to have those drop-down menus with all those choices, but I've had a lot of experience with those popovers menus. People don't use them past a certain depth because what happens in their mind is they just get overwhelmed. Absolutely. And we, and we just recently did a test. In fact, I'll let Sue speak to you, but with Northline Express, some uh, clients that we have and the rest, and he's done some really great tests showing that if you keep it binary at the top levels, which is really useful for silo, siloing anyways. Yep. Okay, it's binary. Like, don't give too many choices. And then once they do a filter or a selection process that narrows it down for them, they actually <laughs> want most of the work done for them. So that actually supports the need to not have everything like an upside down pyramid all on the top of your home page. Right. Siloing is actually the opposite of that. You got to flip that pyramid over. Yeah. And, do, and it actually works for user interface. They don't want, you know, so I can understand e-commerce stores really wanting to put 50,000 products all popping down in one category like right on the home page. I know why they do it. They think it's going to be, you know, more choices, but our testing has shown that it's not helpful, doesn't convert and it doesn't help your SEO. It doesn't. And like if you've got a lot of different products and you want people to be able to find everything, then give them a search box. And right. give them the kind of search box, like if the page from the search comes back with no products found or with no pages found, don't let that show up. Instead, have, um, have some kind of a useful site map page there that directs them to the most popular categories, most popular products, and, um, and you know, you could, you could even give them all of these options that you see as you fly down this menu. You could put all of those on a site map, and site search comes back with nothing, then you show them all those options there, and they'll have a much better um, interaction with your site. I mean, just 
think about Amazon for a minute. Think about the millions of shoppers that they have here every day. They have put a lot of time and money and effort into getting the menus absolutely optimal, right? So I'm, I'm here on a particular product, and what they're doing is they're showing me other subcategories within this same category. And then when I look at the departments, it's still not showing me all of the departments. It's just showing me the most popular top-level departments. And I was walking one of our clients through that because exactly. he had this huge menu and he was unwilling to get rid of it because he wanted to make oh, sure yeah. that, that his customers are completely justifiable. I understand the position that he was in. He wants to make sure that his customers can find his products. But at, the more we talked, the more he was like, you know, I never use Amazon's menus ever. I use a search bar. And I'm like, bingo. Got the point. <laughs> and, yeah. And search bars are really superior. Like we can get, we can have a whole conversation on search bar technologies. Also, I do want to add. I realize for those of you on this call that have massive e-commerce sites, you're dealing with databases and other things. And I know we're not dealing with blogs. Okay. So that's another conversation. And again, you know, see when I do consult on these issues, if things are past a certain size, the answer for many of the questions are it depends. <laughs> you know, so you really have to to make sure of that. Um, I also want to, um, Ruben is saying, what if the home page site is a site map? You know, like, I have that on, on themesinglossary.com, where the entire glossary is just this giant. Yeah. Well, the, my first question would be, Ruben, why is your home page a site map? <laughs> That's the first question I have. And what are you trying to accomplish with that? Um, you know, that's more like a doorway page mentality. I'm not saying that's wrong. Yeah, well, it does depend. So, I... You can't, if you're going to toss that out there, Ruben, you got to give us an example because it depends like 100% on what you're trying to do. There's things I would do with the doorway page and then there's things, I mean, if, I, if a home page is a sitemap, that's a doorway. It's not a regular site for me. I'm just letting you know. That. Oh, he's prettied up his site. He has. He's changed his front page all over again, which is not useful for the, what I wanted to demonstrate. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So he's, he's, but, changed, he's changed the silo structure for the holiday. But, um... A, a lot of times what you want to do, actually I can show that on North Atlanta Express. Um, what I think is a pretty common thing for commerce sites in particular who want to express um, the idea of, of all of the different things they carry, to have something like this that is, um, this is yeah. I, I really like that because it, not only does it give the categories that are also available up at the top, right? But it, it also, like, the fact that it's combined with images makes it so much more touchy-feely and so much more attractive. You're so much more likely to click on something because... And he has actually, since you gave him advice and since we both worked on this, he has actually started to increase sales by even focusing more on image-based siloing. Exactly. So, really great. So it's not that your homepage can't be um, basically a site map, but you just don't want to make it overwhelming. The moment you make it overwhelming, the moment you give people too many choices, they go screaming for the next website. Right. The brain just turns off. They can't process all that information and they just go away. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, okay. Um, based on what, yeah, so where are we with 99 curtains? What's your, so you've made, let me just recap and see if I understand, okay? So what you're saying is that the popover, what do you call the menu structure there? Flyouts. Flyouts um, need to be restructured. If this was a client, you'd tell them, you'd help them restructure yeah, the flyouts, um, and you'd retain a lot of page rank by that redesign, yeah. by that reorganization. Yeah. Okay. So I would, I would get rid of the flyouts. So I would they, just leave the silo menu here. And he's got his subcategory menu down here at the bottom, um, sure. which is fine um, if you're... Like that, that might work out really fine. What you would might be want to bring it up just a little bit. Sue, what would be the fastest way for him to do that? You would just remove the, the menu and you would create a page. So if he clicks on curtains, then, oh, that's actually the home page. So that, that's probably just an option in that menu that you can turn okay. off the, um, the flyout. And then it would just be that on every single page. Mm -hmm. um, let's just look at the rest of the HTML for a second. So the way that would look, for those of you who are new, I've noticed a few new people and some beginners, 
the way it looks like is you click on one of those uh, links and it takes you to a separate page and then there's a unique menu that categorizes products in that way. Yeah. Well, I mean, he's got his, his sub menu down here at the bottom, which um, if you remove the flyout, if you think that that's too far down, then you might want to just figure out a different way to include that. But that's, that's the right idea. Within this, within the blinds, on the blinds um, silo landing page, basically, you want to have the option to all of these other things. Now, if I click here on panel blinds, hopefully, yeah, that's perfect. So it's taking me to blind slash panel blinds. And probably down here, no. So down here we lose. I would have that menu repeated. Oh, you're taking them to the next page. I, mm, I'd probably just link to all of the other, um, I would link back to that, put that whole menu to all of your pages within that silo at the bottom of each one of those pages rather than kind of daisy chaining through each of the pages. Um, there's two reasons for that. One is if, well, first of all, I hope you have a, an XML sitemap so that you're not relying on the search engines actually following your links to find all your pages. Um, but I also wouldn't, I wouldn't want to structure that for people either like that so that they have to daisy chain through once they start down a particular path. If you're going to show all of these here, just show all of them on all the pages. And that's, I, I think that's preferred. And then here on, for example, on this page, on panel blinds, um, I would also link, not only would I link to the other subordinate pages in that, but I would also link back up to blinds. Hmm. Uh, Vincent, I'm not finding your, uh, oh yes, there is a sitemap, sitemap.xml. Okay. Oh, okay, I see you're using, uh, you're using Arnie's. I'm going to tell you, um, Yoast is a really, really good sitemap too, because then you can, you can also cite, you can also, uh, index all those videos. Okay. I, mean, I like that Arnie's updates automatically. Um, Yoast does as well and the video plugin then. I definitely do get a traffic boost on the videos even if it's only 10 or 20 videos on your site and they're not your own. Yoast plugin will get them indexed and they'll give you a thumbnail on the main search engine not just on the video search engine. And that most definitely draws the click, even with some, even over somebody above me on the ranking engine. Okay, so you've got a title, which is great, and you've got a description, which is awesome, and you've even got a call to action in the description, which is excellent. Um, if you really want them to call from the SERPs, Put your phone number in that description and lead with it because you don't want it to get cut off. And I, I don't know so much about blinds, like they might want to come and see your site first. You might get more calls after they hit your site. But there are a lot of, um, of industries out there where guys will just call off the SERPs page. And that's my favorite thing to do at this juncture is stick your phone number in the description or possibly even stick your phone number in the title. Yeah, this looks good. Uh, I have a question. One last thing, Vincent. Um, that button that you have there that says contact SMS, are you getting results from that? Uh, people are asking, wanting SMS. I've never seen that in a button before. Just wondering how that's doing for you. He's also in Europe. Yeah, I agree with Vincent saying click to call. Yeah. There, yeah, that kind. Of, I'm just kind of curious what's uh, what's happening for you, and if you're having some results with that SMS button. Because that SMS to me is not super intuitive, but it's really more popular in Europe. Ruben's got a question for you, Sue. 
Okay. Um, is an outbound link to an authority site really important? If positive, should it appear on the home page? Oh, I don't ever link to another site from my home page. Um, I mean, I suppose there are instances where you absolutely can avoid it, but I wouldn't recommend it. Um, link to authority sites off of the bottom tier of your website. And is it really important? Um, that just so depends. Um, I, here's my take on it. So here's, here's the way that I look at it from the perspective of the search engine. I land on my home page. I want to tell the search engines that I'm an authority about whatever the topic of my website is. So I'm going to link to the other topics on my site because that's what I'm an authority about. And those are my silo landing pages. And then within a silo, within any one silo, I'm going to have more concepts underneath that silo. So I'm going to talk about those concepts in turn, usually on my silo landing page, and link down into those pages. And then within those pages, if there's a tangent idea that is important to what it is that I'm trying to get across to the reader, then I'll link to the authority site on that. So for example, health and wellness industry is really great for linking to authority sites because there's so much to cover in the terms of health and wellness and there's so many great authority sites and um, it helps build trust with your reader. So that's a cool thing to do. If I'm selling wine, I can't think of it. Well, maybe I might link to, um, to one of the, um, the vintners for more information about them. But aside from linking to something like that, I can't think of why I would link to somebody else. You know, I want you to buy wine. I want you to stay on my site and buy wine from me. So I think the more e-commerce oriented you are, the less I would link off-site. And the more information and trust building, like if you've got an empire, if you're actually building an empire and you have a site that's just completely dedicated to trust building, I definitely would link to other authority sites from there. But I would also do a lot of healthy linking to my other sites, like my money site, right? And, um, and if it's my money site and... Yeah, I don't link off-site so much from my money site. Occasionally, but not so much. So, like, you look at themezoom.com, and it's more of a trust-building site. It's the corporate site. And so, like, from my LSI page, I would probably link, I might even possibly link, to, um, to other people who talk about LSI and search engines. Or there might not be anybody else that I really consider... Um, to be talking about that topic in a way that I want to express, so then I don't link. But on that side, I would be more inclined to link, whereas on, um, on NetworkEmpire.com, um, I'm probably just going to link to the other sites in my empire. I'm not going to link to a third-party site. Um, yeah, to, to answer you, Ruben, um, again, we're always, I know Sue is doing this too, we're always clearly delineating in our mind the difference between a WR1 and a WR2. Yep. And for the most part, um, AdSense websites, which is what you're asking about, everyone he's asking, you know, AdSense search bar, would you put an AdSense search bar on the lower tier pages? Do you consider that linking to an authority? I would never use AdSense on any page of any of my authority sites. No. Um, but my WR2s I would all day long. Yeah, I don't absolutely. really mind just at all. <laughs> absolutely. In fact, sometimes they, they can give you some weird boosting effects when you link properly. Um, so you may disagree with that utterly. No, I'm prepared to be wrong. Um, but there are some things. Um, you know, so that's how I would answer that, Ruben, is that really, again, I've learned more and more. It depends. And I've got to tell you, the coolest tool that we've ever had for helping everybody start to keep their head on straight, keep their head on straight, is the one feed to rule them all dot com map or on our themes in glossary dot com. Sue has designed Sue and I have designed a WR1, WR2 system. And it's really easy for us to forget that that's not constantly seared into your brain with a hot iron like it is for us. <laughs> like when we are thinking about anything, I can always tell when I watch Sue thinking or when we're doing our, you know, high end workshops or live certification events. Whenever her Whenever she's thinking things through, she's always mapping where she is on a massive network. 
Okay. Oh, great. Quick buy it. No. Um, <laughs> yeah, I just go to the glossary. So it, it becomes uh, easy when you understand that your WR1 or your profit target, your money site, um, it should be, I hate to use this word, but like kind of sacred, unless it's not. If you're in the affiliate industry, then none of your money sites are like sacred because you're, you don't really own your products or your business. The first thing you have to ask yourself is like if you're selling other people's stuff and you don't own that, you don't have an operations department, and you don't own greater than 60% of the product and the rest, you start to think very differently. It's all about technical savvy. It's all about busting the system. It's all about you know, getting more traffic and because you have to increase the conversion, which is why in Domain Web Studio we put in the um, business decision filter because it matters so much on how much you're willing to pay to promote a site. It's the one web ring, Sue. So it's actually under market domination, the keyword. Ah. Under M's. There you go. Market domination, web ring. There you go. So just you know to remain really clear, I know we keep beating this dead horse, but it's not dead. It's important. <laughs> so clearly, it's I not would, dead. <laughs> no, I would have. I mean, every day I'm grateful for the fact that when we build large networks, whether it's my video sites, whether it's Sue working for large clients, whatever it is we're doing, that we clearly delineate a WR2 mentality from WR1. Yeah. And that our RSS feeds are set up appropriately, and that our linking structure is linking properly. Um, with each other. Yeah. And I know you guys have seen a lot of hubs and a lot of link wheels and a lot of link pyramids and all that stuff. And the problem with those, like when you go to Fiverr or anything else and it talks, we will give you a fully operational link wheel for five dollar. You know, okay. Um, but what they're not doing is teaching you the difference between branding and non-branding platforms that you own and don't own. They will never do that. In fact, when you start to deconstruct, deconstruct the haphazardly sold link wheels, link pyramids, and the rest, you'll find that they don't delineate and they don't have a reasoning behind it that's based on semantics and or branding. You have more to comment, Sue, on that? Can you tell us a little bit yeah, more? Yeah, so um, you, ref you referred to WR1 quite a few times, but I just want to point out for guys that might be new on the call is that those are your branded websites. And you don't want to stick, if, you're a, if you actually have a brand or if you're pseudo branding an affiliate product, you don't want to stick AdSense on that site because think about what that does to your brand. You're basically saying, oh, and if you don't find a product that you want from me, there's these products over here. And it's just, it's not you centric, right? So on your WR1 branded sites, you want to be completely you centric. That's your golden frame where you tell your clients why you're the best possible option within your market. And you don't want to, to water that down with any kind of other advertising. So then when you go out to your WR2 sites, which are your non-branded sites, and your WR3 sites, which are even a further layer out than that, then that's fine to do AdSense there because they're not branded sites anyway. They're, um, they might have a persona that you've created that's associated with them or right. just UI non-branded right. sites. Right. I know that a lot of... Go ahead. And you can always throw... I mean, you know, Sue and I get this all the time. You can always throw exceptions at us like, well, johnchow.com has AdSense at the bottom. Well, keep in mind that once you have a million and a half visitors per day, um, you know, at this point, you're just a money bucket. But even so, we still would not recommend that you do that. Mm -hmm. Because you can monetize, if you've got, these are called portal sites, you can monetize to the highest bidder at that point, and AdSense right. ain't one of them. No. Okay, and not only that, it bleeds your theme. So there, even when you're a million dollar a day site, and you can sell advertising for $5,000 a month, um, you're still going to want to make sure that you don't bleed your theme. I still show those kinds of sites to Sue to make sure that I am not, you know, she's my oversight on everything that I do with that. Make sure that I haven't bled something because there's always a better way to put the images and to put the banners and, and the way to organize it on the back end so that you don't lose anything and you maintain your rankings even though yep. you're bleeding the homepage to the highest bidder. <laughs> so yeah. there's a way to do it. And Ruben, there's not really a, ne a need to use different computers when you're building out these networks. But again, this is stuff we teach in the advanced certification. I will say, however, that there is a real need to quarantine. Let's just put it this way. You're going to be using incognito a lot on your browser. Right. <laughs> okay. when, you do your, when you do your WR2, I mean, you can't really, I mean, Google knows what Google knows. I mean, they've actually got it all networked. We've, we've seen some ridiculous things even with incognito. All right. But the main thing is that you just want to make sure that the personas there should be a one-to-one -one relationship for a complete and independent identity 
on Google. If you plan on using Google Plus, if you don't care about Google Plus, then just keep your identity separate. You know. So my point here is that I I prefer now after all a couple of painful experiences that there's a one-to-one -one relationship of a Gmail account to an individual blog that's just me personally on WR2s. And you and definitely if you feel like you need to have a separate computer. Um, or even a separate uh, login or maybe a separate user on your computer just so you personally don't forget to connect accounts. I've had two people contact me, one of them the last day, where they've connected a WR1 email account to a WR2 oh. network on accident. Ouch. And guess what? Just like you can't, you cannot, you can no longer disconnect a YouTube, a YouTube account to, from your Gmail account once you've connected it anymore. It's done. You're screwed. Okay, this is just a fact. I learned this last night because Sue and I were talking and she was like, hey man, you really ought to remove ThemeZim's YouTube account from your Gmail account now, five years later. You know? <laughs> and the thing is, is that, so I'm on, with, I'm on YouTube's major page last night and they're saying you can only disconnect from your YouTube from your Gmail account if you're a legacy user. That means prior to 2009. Otherwise, you're screwed. They don't say you're screwed on the page, but they might as well have. Okay, and so this is powerful stuff to remember that where Google is going, this is why we're talking about cybernetics. Keep your WR2 personas utterly separate, never mix them up, create complete different identities and dashboards, and if you need to have separate compu computers, Ruben, so that you personally don't forget because you're not savvy enough to not connect across, then do that. Okay, but just remember, you really don't want to start connecting those personas. Okay, it's got an interesting question. Um... Oh, what, Ruben? Oh, yeah. Okay, so, gee, I planned it. <laughs> yeah, good luck with it, man. Yeah, let us know how that goes. Um, so Kate's talking about um, how do you prevent your competitors from knowing what your web properties are and how do you hide your footprint? That's actually um, not a light question. The easiest thing that you want to do uh, or the the most fundamental thing is when you buy the domain, you want to to um, oh, shoot. I forget what it's called, but you want to shield your identity when you buy the domain. And um, you can go so far if you've got multiple legal entities. You can go so far as to have a different legal entity buy those domains. Now, I want you to know that um, Google can look behind that. There, um, if they get, if they have reason to, and most of the time they don't have reason to, but if you're in a very competitive market and people are playing dirty, um, just know that that won't protect you. Having it, uh, you actually want it owned by a different legal entity with a different address so that they can't connect that very easily. They can look behind that shielded identity. So then, you know, past that point, when you go to, um, to make multiple sites and all that kind of good stuff, you want to make sure that you remove all your sites there, or all of your footprints there too. Um, again, if you're not in the competitive market, if um, it's not a lot of dollars, if your competitors aren't out for blood, then it's not a big deal. Um, but you know, you get some of these, you know, like insurance and lawyers and some of these guys that where each uh, referral is worth big dollars those people get really nasty in terms of trying to take down the competition. Yeah, use a physical, different physical address. Use all kinds of, yeah, you want to make it as much of a variable as you possibly can. But. Yeah, I mean, it's getting kind of funny because, you know, we had a meeting last week with a billion dollar corporation. I'm not going to leave any names. And one of the big issues for their digital department, I think they were like 4.9 billion or something. Their digital department was really a big concern, like multiple addresses on local and stuff like that. You can see even the big guys, you know, just really recognizing how it's networking together and having to take into consideration for their clients, or even if they, like these guys have thousands upon thousands of clients, you know, it's become an issue to be able to integrate all that. And I just find it really fascinating and where things are going for sure. Yep. Okay, there's a lot of questions coming in, Sue. What, if, what would you like to do? Where would you like to take this? Do you want to do another one? Are we done for today and we move and we wait for next month? Or what would you like to do? Well, um, Katie, Katie, same on you. 
I'm just kidding, girl. <laughs> um, yeah, they would be out for blood. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. you got to watch your step in that industry. Um, yeah. and, and remember, Kate, uh, Katie, in the in that industry, um, you're in a different world. The gravity is not precisely the same. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they are. They are a world unto themselves. Um. Yeah, we got a lot of questions that came in more about footprints and all of that kind of stuff, and and that's a, a black hole. Like you can go down that topic for a very, let's not very, go very down long way. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> let's let's not do that today. I know that, but you know, you guys are asking the right question. I mean, I'm really blown away where the privacy issue is actually going. You know, Vincent mentioned that. Yeah. Post here recently. Um, I could actually go on, and then she would, Sue would have to shut me up, and I'd start ranting and getting really loud, <laughs> and then I would be talking about, um, you know the digital Armageddon and this and that. But I'm actually really not concerned about it because the main thing I want you guys to be aware of is is that uh, we kind of know where things are going. And at the end of the day, it's just going to amount to, uh, it's really interesting. It's just like keeping your personal privacy and your personal identity uh, anonymous as well. A lot of the same principles that you can read in J.J. Luna's book, How to Be Invisible, are becoming more and more true in the digital domain. And those are all, they're all legal. They're legal things. But they just require common sense. You know, and the common sense is don't give everybody your personal home address, for example. Or if you don't want to be subpoenaed, if you don't want to accept for value uh, a contract, or um, if you don't want to accept for value a subpoena or anything like that, if you're not around to accept it, it's no good. So the main thing is, is just, you know, if you want to create private identities, you know, you're going to see a huge boom in both reputation management and identity protection and creation over the next few years like we've ever seen before because as Google moves towards ver- identity verification as being a parameter in the core algorithm, that's where things get weird. And, you know, Sue actually talked about this four years ago. I mean, mm-hmm. I remember, and Sue was like, <laughs> she was like, yeah, yeah, and I was like, no way. And she was like, yeah, blah, blah. <laughs> yeah. And, and the thing was, she was just essentially saying that, you know, she gave me a picture of a world, which is now happening, which is every behavior, every incognito, not, not incognito, whatever Google product you're using will make up your semantic thumbprint and your product consumer thumbprint. Yeah. And it's available to them 100% of the time. And you can see it now in retargeting or your second list or, yep. you know, when you go around all the websites and you see, wow, I've just been, I've been on that site a lot this week. That banner's been popping up a lot. And then once in a while you'll catch them at something and they'll pull up a banner that's completely semantically unrelated to the site that you're on. You're like, wait a second. <laughs> you're freaking following me. And it's not even semantic anymore. That's just privacy issue. Okay. And so that's what's happening. It's all part of the digital thumbprint and the dashboard and, you know, you got to start treating your own personal identity and your client's identity with care. And, set, and this is why we've set up the WR2 and WR1 buffer. Yep. Okay. Have I said it, Sue? Is that yeah, enough? Yeah, I think so. Okay. All right, cool. So I was scrolled back up a little bit, and we've got a couple of questions in there about local rankings and Google Places. And, Come um, on, Sue, one more, one more silo course. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just want to say this, that... The, um, to rank on Google Places is moving a lot more toward the same kinds of algorithms as ranking on Google Normal, Google Legacy. Um, however, you're absolutely right when you say you notice a difference with the Google Plus. Um, I notice very few places in Google Places that don't have Google Plus. Uh, it's, having Google Plus is not going to necessarily bounce you to the top. But if your competitors have Google+, Plus, you're going to need Google+, Plus to show up on that front page. Um, and past that, it's, it's an art form. Can I mention local oxygen? Well, you're not there to yes, say Yes, uh, you may absolutely mention it. All right, so... Um, no, no, no you, absolutely, <laughs> you can absolutely mention local oxygen. So, these guys are great. Um, Chris, over at Local Oxygen, has really oh, got so. it. Yeah, he's, he's really got it nailed. Um, there's a set of variables, and all you really have to do is tick each variable, like, you know, just dot all of your I's and cross all of your T's, and you will rank really well for places. And he has it nailed. He can do it time and time and time again. And yeah. um, 
the cool thing about his membership is um, when it gets into some of the nitty-gritty stuff, um, he will do all of those things for you. If you don't want to do it, you can, if you're a, an online provider, an online marketing provider, um, you can turn around and resell his services. And what he's put together is um, a quality product. I, I've looked at it, I'm subscribed to it, and I totally stand behind all of the I's that he's dotting and T's that he's crossing. So, um, so if you're having problems with that, you might want to consider that. Um, there's the vast majority, like I'll say that in our membership area, I cover the broad brush strokes in the uh, local market domination. I don't cover every single, I don't dot all the I's that he dots, but I cover all the basics. So, um, but if you've done everything that's in there, in terms of, you know, having your maps and having your V cards and your H cards and metadata and um, you've, um, you've tweaked out, you've got to have, the keywords have to be on your site, the keywords should be in your Google Places, um, you need to have all of your citations, and if you've done all of that and you're still not ranking against your competitors, then give Chris a shot. Okay, so did we have another site that you were saying, come on, Sue, let's do one more? Yeah, I think we did. Um, for If anybody that we missed, um, we have so many questions just streaming on the screen now that I'm trying to back up. Uh, I didn't want to forget, um, where is this? We missed someone. Oh, Goran, are you still with us? It would say he's gone if he is. Because I'm not. Oh, yeah, he's there. Goran, did you want us to do to look at your site? I, the reason I would love to look at your site, if you're okay with it, is because of the size and the page rank. Are you cool with that, or would you want to keep it private? I wasn't sure. You tossed the link out there, but I wasn't sure if I could um, show it. And now, of course, obviously, we're not going to be hypercritical or anything. We'll just, <laughs> And it's not. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, you what was the site? Okay, because the reason I bring it up is because you know he gave uh, Goran gave me a little pushback on the menu, thing, uh -huh. and that he's got a great. It's a great site. It's also got a really really large menu. Okay. And I just wanted I wanted to see you know what would Sue do. What's the site? It's called the TanningGuru.com, with a the Tanning and then two G's TanningGuru.com. I'm showing a tool, uh, toolbar page rank too. Yeah. For what it's worth. Yeah. And is it the previous post that you're talking about that's the long menu? Oh, that is a previous post menu. Okay. I'll take it back. It's not, like a, not technically a menu. It is a menu, actually. They're all links to pages. And yeah, it, it kind of behaves like be, a menu, though. Yeah, it's not it's, formally a menu, is what I mean. <clears throat> Um, Are you doing the uh, evergreen traffic system, Goran? Is that what I'm seeing here? That Keith thing? Oh, okay, gotcha. No, you're saying you kind of seem to have dropped in page rank. Whoops. Okay. Interesting. So, I don't actually, I mean, there must be categories, but I'm not seeing a category menu. I would be inclined to replace your previous post menu with a category menu. Um, yeah. Just because that's going to, I mean, blog's already a little bit silo because of the nature of their categories, but when you've got such a long list of previous posts, 
you're bleeding all your different categories together. You're not giving the search engines specific ideas. But um, if you're if you have a really niche blog, and all of your content is pretty much about the same kind of thing, then it's not so bad, right? You you still this is still just real like really a lot of links off your homepage. Um, It's actually a lot of links off your homepage. When I stop and take a look at what you got, you've got ads. You've got, this might be in an iframe. It might not be bleeding your theme, but you've got this thing, Scoop It, which I'm, I would put money on it goes to Scoop It, which is like taking people off of your golden frame to a third-party site. So if this is your your money blog, I would be inclined to more keep people here rather than sending them to Twitter and skip it and that kind of thing. Um, if this is just like a, if this is a traffic blog, like if you're just doing this to engage people, then it's great. Yeah, I mean, it's, he's saying that it is his own scoops. Right. And that's, that's okay. That's fine, but um, it still takes him off site. That reminds me, I have a, oh, I'm supposed to meet him on a phone call, Gillom. Okay. Um, the main thing is that he's never been able to convince me to use that widget. <laughs> <laughs> we, have, we have an ongoing thing about it. It's like, it really is, um, I was going to ask you about that, see what you thought of the widget. I mean, it essentially follows back, I think. Let's see. Um, but I think it might also get traffic. Tanning me, Carl J. I haven't really looked at that. But I've had a couple of questions. Of, should I use the Skip It widget on my page? I've noticed, Goran, that Skip It um, really generates traffic from the traffic that comes from rescoops. All right, so the good news is it's in an iframe. So it's only one link. Um, All right. The bad news is it's still a link off-site, and it has the potential to take your traffic off-site, more to the point. What, what I really try to do with social media is drive traffic to my site and not necessarily drive traffic away from my site. Um, right. A little bit of social media, particularly, let's just see what you've got on here. Like, you know, those, those um, like boxes where you've got the Facebook like boxes where you've got um, – a set of faces or something along those lines. That also provides social proof. I know you can click over to Facebook that way, but the social proof I feel like is um, more than outweighs the link off-site. Um, it's not actually actively engaging people and dragging them away, whereas this is like, oh, I could read something here that really catches my fancy, and boom, I'm gone off your site. Um, so, yeah, I tend, to, I tend to do things the other way around. I tend to post on my blog first and then take it to Scoop It. So I'm more interested, like Scoop It, this, this little thing would be a perfect, um, I don't have that up anymore, but this would be a perfect widget for WR2 blogs and WR3 blogs, a way to get my content, my primary content, my Scoop It content onto unbranded domains, because then that's going to drive more people via Scoop It back to my site. Google's not going to follow that um, as a direct link back to my site. So then I can have more links into my golden frame by diversifying stuff that way. But totally, totally. I, I'm going to go ahead and give everybody, because you know, everybody is so super patient, Sue, so I'm going to give the whole Storify Scoop It main site trifecta real quick. Okay. Is that cool? Sure. Okay. Right, get out a pencil, piece of paper, write this down. <laughs> <laughs> um, here's something really, really cool, Gorn. Um, donate. I'm not going to donate to you, dude. <laughs> what am I donating to? But I like it, you know. You, you're not going to get paid if you don't ask. Absolutely. Cool okay. Um, all right. So, uh, Stu, can you pop that map up uh, to that you had? Oh, did we close the? Um, I'm afraid one? I did. But I can oh, get don't back ever there. close that. I have it up on my wall, like printed out. You should. Because I'm not very smart, and I forget stuff like every five minutes. 
my, mem my memory is going, and then I'm on to the next social media tweet. Okay, so, um, all right, so you have Goran and everybody else, so you have your WR1, right, which is, I'm not sure, I think your blog is a core site. Um, well, the WRS1, that would be your scoop it, so just hover over there yeah. so you on the WRS1. That's going to be your scoop it thing. Now, you're asking yourself, okay, do I put a widget from my WRS1 on my WR2, or, you know, from my WRS1 to my WR1 blog? Not generally. I mean, I've been doing a lot of testing. I even had a Quora widget. I had um, Scoop It widget. I'm not real sure about it. I was actually getting some weird results with the Google Plus widget, and then it kept breaking because Horowitz over there kept changing everything. Anyway, uh, what you want to do is your WRS1 Scoop It magazine should be clearly copying or imitating your cluster of themes that you, of course, researched in Kraken. I know you're all being good girls and boys and research and crack. <laughs> and the co-occurrence is all there. So those pages should be your, your top money, or Domain with Studio, your top money keywords when you make your, your Scoop It magazines, okay? And then your other WRS1, which is like a twin sister to Scoop It or brother or whatever, is uh, Storify. And you're going to make something called a micro press release is what, you know, this is a part of our proprietary system we're creating right now. And what you're going to do is you're going to, whenever you have an article, you're going to create a short story out of it on Scoop It I'm sorry, I've got to be really careful. You're going to create a short story on Storify, and you're going to pull in all the elements that you use for that story, even if it's your own articles and other blogs, in Storify. And then you're going to scoop your Storify story into the appropriate semantic keyword. Okay, and what you'll see is a page rank of anywhere from two to three on your various Storify platforms with anywhere from two to four weeks. It's very, very fast. And the reason this happens is because you're tweeting out your Storify story which is pointing back to your site, it's very high page rank. It's got your Google Plus and your Twitter and everything else in it. Okay, but then you're scooping it into a surgically targeted niche that does get about an average of three to four visitors per day, but sometimes they're retweeted. As soon as the I'm sorry, sometimes they're retweeted and rescooped. When that happens, that's the simplest method that I've found to build page rank passively. The only thing that's not automatic is your storify story, okay? Because you have to create it manually. It also helps very much if you follow uh, what Sue and I taught in the one feed to rule them all system, which is to use Twyla. Twyla turns your Twitter account into a website and shows you where you are and are not bleeding your Twitter account. Because, you know, once you start tweeting things out and you have this, like, rolling stream of stuff, you lose track of what's happening. And most addicts are tweeting other people's things. Twyla is really cool as long as you're not a, what they call an egg, a new Twitter account. Twyla is very easy to use because it just simply software by Kim, Kim and her husband, uh, husband and wife team that really had a great idea to turn all of your tweets into a web page. Now, it's mostly meaningless if you're tweeting a bunch of other people's stuff. But if you're retaining page rank and retaining, retaining links and you're only tweeting myself, you're retaining all that stuff and pointing it back between Twyla, Storify, and Scoop It, always pointing back to your own site, folks. What you're going to see is generating PageRank out of thin air, which is really what PageRank is all about. Don't get Sue started. Okay, pointing back to your primary WR1. Now think about this. If everything that I just told you on this call was not your own stuff, what we call premium content curation, your own stuff, and was other people's stuff, it would mean exactly jack. If it's your own stuff, you're retaining the PageRank, passing on traffic, and using other people's platforms, WRS1s, to drive traffic to your own site while you're creating buoyant page rank for your own site. And it works every time. So just remember, each time you do an article, to storify it and create a little micro press release, spin it out, scoop it, and then move on to the next one. So that's a little bit of a sneak peek of what we teach in curationprofits.com and OneFeed and the rest. All of this is part of only tweeting yourself. People think we're selfish and we don't understand social media. No. The fact is, is that we do understand social media. We understand what it's good for and what it's not good for. So hopefully that will help you guys start retaining a little bit more page rank to your main primary money site. And if you have a silo architecture on your primary money site, it's about 10 times stronger. Right, Sue? Yep. Okay. Absolutely. I'll go ahead, I'll go ahead and stop there. <laughs> All right. So do we have any other questions? Are we done for the day? Probably good for the uh, the day. Um, oh wow, we have a guest lecturer. Can I use oh. your name? Can I use your name, Matt, or not? Probably not. 
<laughs> okay, Matt Trainer, welcome. <laughs> yeah, okay, so he's saying that he found that retweeting his own stuff and then pointing press releases at the retweets get great results too. And this is something that Matt is currently helping oh, me, mentoring me. Yeah, because we're going to be running a big test on it. And we'll tell you whether or not he's insane. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that, I don't think, to me, the logic makes sense. So we're going to test that. Yeah, thanks for that, Matt. That's really cool. And I, uh, I won't mention buzz hubs or anything yet, since I know you're not ready for that. Whoops, did I just, no, oh, sorry. okay. <laughs> yeah, we know you're totally insane. Okay, so I think we'll probably wrap it up. Um, I also got a comment here from Vincent. Oh, no, I can't. Vincent, I never know when it's you're doing uh, like, super secret stuff. Or yeah, I think that's just a super stop, secret stuff. Stop talking, Jenny. <laughs> That's about as black as you get, dude. Okay. So anyway, I want to thank everybody for being here. And we've had a lot of really cool – oh, it's not? Oh, so you want me to announce that? Okay. All right. Vincent is saying that um, – no. <laughs> okay. So I really, want to th I really want to thank everybody. Uh, Greg Morrison, it was really um, great to have you here, um, associates from Bring the Fresh and other folks we're working with, Internet Marketing Field. Um, Don, also Matt, really great to have you, and obviously we need to have more conversation. Uh, Vincent, I hope, Deb, that you got some help and everybody who had their site review today. Um, I know that there's a lot to learning. Oh, you did, okay. Uh, and again, Deb, we are going to walk you through an issue that you're having with the DWS thing. Yeah. Uh, we're going to meet next month. Uh, we're doing these once a month on the first Tuesday of each month. Oh yeah, so Vincent, you're all the way in Singapore, right? Vincent, not We'll, not we'll make sure that we uh, send you coffee for next month. Sad, you have to get up early. Okay, so I really appreciate all of you guys. Uh, it's gonna be even hotter and more intense uh, next month. This is for members only. We're gonna go ahead and put the replay for members only. And we will not be uh, inviting non-members uh, further uh, on these calls, and so I really appreciate everyone's help. Those of you who did not get an opportunity to have Sue and I audit your website today, uh, please go ahead and join us uh, next month. I guess it's going to be, wow, it'll be next it'll year, be, won't it? Yeah, 2013, can you believe that? Assuming the world hasn't ended and the Armageddon, <laughs> and the Armageddon meme hasn't been uh, proven to be the anomaly or the exception. We will all be here in January and on the first Tuesday. In the meantime, we have a lot of things rolling out. We look forward to seeing everybody on the inside. Thank you so much, Sue, for helping us out today. Hey, thank you. It's been a pleasure, guys. Um, I love you, and we'll see you later.